And welcome, welcome to Big Woods Bible Church, especially if this is your first time, we welcome you from our hearts. Happy Father's Day. Dads, if you are here, fathers, grandfathers, please stand up so we can simply recognize you. And as you stand, I'm going to ask that you remain as we pray and ask God's blessing on you. Luke, you are a father. The daddies to be in the next, what, eight weeks, I heard from Aaron. Um, just look at these good looking guys. And as we look at them, may we be thankful for the gifts that they are. And may we be faithful to lift them up in prayer. If the enemy can knock out a father, knock down a dad, he has full access into that home, into that family. So we need to pray that our dads remain strong and faithful before the Lord. Would you bow your heads and pray with me? Father, as we just have song behold our god thank you that we can have a relationship with you you're our heavenly father and you have adopted us into your own family to be your children through the work and by the work of jesus thank you for that fathers we celebrate a day just to honor and remember our dads Lord, our prayer is that you would protect these men. Homes and families, marriages are under attack. There's no doubt. I believe, according to your word, that the dad's fathers are to lead and protect their homes. And Father, we pray, Lord, as the enemy would love to knock out any one of them, that you will give them a, a renewed strength today. That they would be reminded of the role that they have to love their wives well, as Christ has loved the church. To raise their children, sons and daughters in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Father, we pray for blessing and protection upon each of them. We thank you for the example that you have given to us in yourself of what a faithful, loving father looks like. Father, I, I pray as well for these few moments that we have together in your word. Please, Lord, and I personally, I just plead for your help this morning, that you would, you would grant wisdom, the right words, to be your words. Most importantly, that you would be glorified, that Christ would be exalted. Bless us now, bless this church. We ask this in strong and amazing and powerful and wonderful name of our Savior, the Messiah Jesus. Amen. And amen. Gentlemen, you may be seated. <clears throat> we begin a new series today called what I, what I call From Struggle to Strength. I want to begin with this definition just so that everyone knows that they are included here this morning. The word struggle literally is defined as this, to contend with an adversary or opposing force. To contend resolutely with a task, a, a problem, to strive. The noun form of the word struggle is the process or an act or instance of struggling. A war, a fight, a conflict, a contest of any kind. Definition of the word struggle, an introduction to our new series from struggle to strength. Every single one of us. All of us, at some level, live with struggle. Some of our earliest memories go back to when we were little. Our struggles and clashes with what? With our siblings, brothers and sisters. Struggles, disagreements with parents, conflicts with classmates or teammates or roommates, friends and foe. All of us have faced at some level what? A bloody nose, a broken window, a spanking, a detention slip, a dirty look from someone that we did not deserve, 
remember watching my, my, my little sister Ruthie who had a phenomenal arm as she threw a walnut across the living room and hit my older sister Trishy right between the eyes, shattering the walnut. It was an amazing throw. The introduction of what struggle looks like. As adults, we still face struggle. Struggles in our marriages with our spouse. In our families, with our own kids. In our workplace, with our bosses or our colleagues. Even, even at church, people can face Struggle with what? A nasty word someone says, a rude response, an uncalled for comments. No doubt that we can also struggle what? Not just with other people. We can actually struggle with and live with inner conflict in our own lives. We actually struggle with ourselves, thoughts and ideas and habits and patterns. Which causes anxiety and stress and worry and fear and doubt. This idea of struggle, it seems that some people at, at some levels love it. They, they relish in struggle and they seem to handle it and they rise in strength. And we're amazed by those people that are few in number. Others, probably most of us, hate struggle. We don't want it. We try to, to hide from it, to crawl into a hole. Some people seem to create struggle as problem makers wherever they go. Others seem to calm struggles. What are we to do this with this? With this idea that God has called us to live in a broken world. How do we handle it? Why, in a sense, has God even allowed struggle? Today, by way of introduction into our study in First and Second Samuel, it's going to be a little different. It's not going to be a verse-by-verse verse approach, but rather more of a high-level character study of the prominent figure of First and Second Samuel. His name is David. David faced struggle. It seems from the very first moment we were introduced to him, right here in our text this morning, First Samuel chapter 16, as what? He's a forgotten teenager. Tending sheep on the back 40. To his very final recorded words in 2 Samuel 23. He begins his final comment with this, and I quote, Worthless men are like thorns that are thrown away. David's what arguably you know is one of the most well-known characters in all of Scripture. From the Old Testament, this little shepherd boy who kills the giant soldier Goliath who rises to be the greatest king in Israel's history. All the way to the New Testament where it is through his line the Messiah Jesus was born and an angel announced, remember this, for unto you is born this day in the city of David. A Savior, which is Christ the Lord. He just couldn't escape struggles. As a matter of fact, one of the easiest struggles that he ever faced was actually with the giant Goliath. The problem was solved with one well-aimed stone. But you realize that he would never, ever, from that point onward, resolve a struggle that quickly. Struggle with King Saul led on for over ten years. Struggle with his own family made him the subject of public ridicule and national scandal. But you realize that we, this morning, can learn how to move like David from struggle to strength. That's what we need. First and second Samuel are not academic works. Not a lot of deep theology here. They're more like what we could call what narratives. They're, they're story books. They're, they're meant to be read as a narrative. Stories. 
There's poetry in here, prophecy, genealogy, government records, military honors list, but a vast majority of it is just the stories of real people like you and I living everyday real life. Family stories, there's, there's births and marriages and deaths, there's battle stories, ongoing struggles for survival. Stories of just men and women and children and grandparents, rich and poor, country folk and city folk. But ultimately, this story, like all of scripture, has a central theme. First and second Samuel carry with it what? The story ultimately of God. And his redemptive plan to restore fallen mankind unto himself. The gospel is central. Like all of scripture, especially here in first and second Samuel. Officially, one commentator writes, and I quote, the central theme of the books of Samuel is God God's exercising of his cosmic kingship by inaugurating a Davidic dynasty in Israel. Not a, not a Saul-eyed one by electing the holy city Zion as the place where David's successor will establish the temple for worship of the divine king Yahweh. That's a wordy description of the theme. Let me summarize it here. God is the star of the show. God is always the star of the show. Always was, always will be. Like any book throughout all of scripture as he weaves his plan to rescue and restore, redeem mankind unto himself. Fulfilling what? His purpose with his plan using his people in his places. Pick it up with me. I'm reading from the ESV. That's the text that I I preach from. It'll be in front of you. 1 Samuel 16. Again, we have a lot of ground to cover. Nothing but celebrations of fathers the whole rest of the day. So tuck in here for a few moments, okay? Here it is. The Lord said to Samuel, "How, How long will you grieve over Saul since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I I will send you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite. For I've provided for myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. The Lord said, take a heifer with you. You ever afraid? Just take a heifer with you. And say, I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. And invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for him, for me, him whom I declare to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him, trembling, and said, Do do you come peaceably? And he said, peaceably, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look. Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance. But the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shema pass by and he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. And Jesse made seven of his sons passed before Samuel, and Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen these. Then Samuel said to Jesse, Are are all your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, but behold, he's keeping the sheep. 
Samuel said to Jesse, send and, and get him, for we will not sit down till he comes. And he sent and he brought him in. Now he was ruddy and he had beautiful eyes and was handsome. And the Lord said, arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. And Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. Three points I want to give to you this morning. The first one is this. God has a plan to rescue his people. We have to see this in this text. Now, although it is still a long time until the birth of the Messiah, Jesus, the Lord, even at this moment, is putting his perfect plan in place. Let's back up a little bit and gain the context here. The nation Israel had been in trouble, understatement. Um, after being freed from bondage, they were led out of Egypt by Moses. They wandered 40 plus years in the wilderness. God handed the reins of leadership from Moses to Joshua, who led them into the promised land. It's described as a land that is flowing with milk and honey. It's also what? A land that is flowing with enemies who want the Israelites dead. Plenty of people who do not like Israel, although there were many battles and victories after war, literally years of war and conflict and bloodshed and rebellion and repentance, Israel, just like you and I, they wanted to be like everyone else. So they said, we want a king. We want a king to lead us. And God graciously granted it. The people chose a man, it says in 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 2, whose name was Saul. It says that he stood head and shoulders above everyone else. Saul looked the part. As a sign of God's sovereignty, Samuel anointed Saul to be king. And Saul was everything. The big, strong leader who looked the part was given everything to succeed. But he failed. He failed in virtually every single area of life. Israel was still in trouble. Saul was their hope. And all of their hopes had been dashed. Samuel is now in grief. The prophet, what is next? G. Frederick Owen in his book, Abraham to the Middle East Crisis, describes those exact days perfectly in just one sentence. I love this. The people were on a long drift from God. That's the condition. It's, it's almost picturesque of what is happening in our very own world today. People are on a long drift from God. But thankfully, thankfully, God had a plan. God chose a man. However, the first apparent problem was that the man was not yet a man. He was not ready yet. Instead, he was a boy. Probably a teenager. 13, 14, 15, 16 years old. Somewhere in that range. Oh, so fun of an age. Mark Twain says when it comes to raising teenagers, what? When they turn 13, just put them in a barrel a wooden barrel, nail the lid shut, and keep a little knot hole for them to breathe through. This is Mark Twain, not me. He says when they turn 16, just plug the knot hole. <laughs> That's David. Teenager at best. Young, absent, forgotten. Yet God himself clearly reveals, I have provided for myself a king. A king leads. A king rules. A king directs. A king protects. Note carefully all of the statements that we read here declaring really who's king in this whole setup anyway. Who's really in charge? Who's calling the shots? God himself says, I have rejected him, Saul. 
God himself says, I will send you, Samuel. God himself says, I have provided for myself a king. God himself says, I will show you what to do. So what we need to see here, what's really happening. Yes, there is a storyline, a narrative, and it's a good one. It's a cool one. A king is chosen that no one would ever expect. A king is anointed who didn't look the part from a brood of brothers who all look the part. But they all lacked something. They lacked the key ingredient to what God was looking for. You see, tucked within this narrative is the clear fact that there's only one true God who's not only sovereignly moving all the pieces to protect and provide and rescue and redeem his people, but thankfully the king, the sovereign king, sees you and me and he's teaching to us lessons along the way. Here's the lesson that God wants us to learn from this text this morning. Number two, God's plan is generally not like your plan. God's plan to rescue is generally not what you and I would choose. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Now, if we lived on the farm right next to Jesse's farm... We would probably not even know the name of his youngest son. You see, the reason is this. Everyone, everyone in town knew and heard of Iliab, the firstborn. Oh, those annoying firstborn. They're in charge. They know they're in charge. And what? He was the starting quarterback. He set state records. He was big. He was tall. He was strong. Samuel, the prophet himself, said this, and I quote, Surely the Lord's anointed is before me. Eliab walked in and captured the place. Surely this is the guy. God said, no, I rejected him. Like, like that? Like, no, I, I rejected him. So they march in the second son, Abinadab. He didn't hold the state passing records. The reason is because he scored higher on his SATs than anyone else. Piles of scholarships were what? Clogging up the mailbox. He wasn't as big and strong, but maybe he was smarter than all the others. Straight A's since kindergarten. Uh, we know those people too. God says, I have rejected him. Well, there's, there's more to come. Shema, Shema, come in. Come in here, Shema. Shema is your third born. Maybe he wasn't the athlete. Maybe he wasn't the scholar. But man, he was fun to hang around, wasn't he? And he could capture... And he could communicate. Surely this is the one. God's response is what I have rejected him. They march in number four and number five and number six. Seven sons in total. Imagine the grocery bill for poor mama and daddy. Seven boys. Every single one of them, they walk across with their head high and their shoulders are back. And they looked Samuel in the eye. Yes, sir. Sharp, smart, put together. And I love Samuel's question to Jesse. Um, is everybody here? I love his question here. Are all of your sons here? He's like, I, you know, I checked my GPS. I know I'm at the right spot. I know this. Something's not adding up. Dad says what? Well, there remains the youngest, but he's out on the back 40. He's tending the sheep. Now, don't, don't get angry 
with Jesse here. Because you and I do exactly the same thing. You realize in the context of local church that we are a part of, we will oftentimes, oftentimes describe individuals like this. Yes, he's a good guy. But, you know, he did some time several years ago. He's, he's a good guy, but, you know, he doesn't really seem to keep himself very well. He's a good guy, but, you know, he had, he had that drinking problem. He's a good guy, but he's, he's kind of overweight. She's cool. But you know, uh, you know, she struggled with anorexia. She had a drug problem. You know that she's kind of outspoken. He's a good guy, but he's, he's kind of soft-spoken. We do this all the time when we describe people. She's, she's a delight. You do know that she had an abortion in the past. You, you do know that, yeah, neat couple, but they, they got a divorce. Yeah, this is their second marriage. Good guy, but you do know that he cheated, right? In the past, it was that time. Good guy, but he swore she got pregnant before they got married. He lied. He, he never graduated. Yeah, she dropped out. He got, he got fired. She failed. Good person, but at some level, somebody rejected them. And on and on and on and on. Here's the lesson that we have to be reminded of this morning that King Jesus is speaking to you and I about as we move from struggle to strength. What? Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. Thankfully, thankfully, I love how Dr. Urban Lutzer says when God measures a person, he puts the tape around the heart and not the head. You know what that means? There's like hope for people like me. And there's hope for people like you. Think, think about this. Who would have ever, ever, ever picked Moses who couldn't even speak right to lead? Who would have ever picked Jonah? He's prejudiced to go and evangelize. Who would have ever picked Peter? Unpredictable. To preach. Who here would have ever picked the Apostle Paul? He was a terrorist to plant churches. You know, that list is long and it concludes with what? There is no one who would have ever even picked Jesus to die. Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 2 says it describes Jesus that there is no beauty that we should desire him. Physically, blended into the crowd, disappeared. There is nothing that we would have looked at that would have said, there, there's the king. Thirdly and finally, God's plan and I want you to know this this morning. I want you to hear this. God's plan is that you, like David, are called for his purpose. Back to the, back to the story. There, there remains the youngest, but he's keeping the sheep. And, and Samuel said to Jesse, send it and get him. We're not going to sit down until this boy gets here. They sent and they brought him. I don't know how far he was away. Maybe it took some time. Maybe the brothers are chuckling like, yeah, right. This is a waste. Dad, can we go now? 
Now, it says that he was ruddy. The word in Hebrew is admonai. It, it means reddish. Whether or not he had red hair or probably more red skin just from being out in the sun. Sun burnt, wind burnt. It says that he was ruddy, but he had beautiful eyes. And he was handsome. And the Lord said, arise, anoint him. And I love this. These words are underlined in my Bible. For this is he. Any one of us. Yeah, I, 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 I can't do what my older brother could do. Or I, I can't measure up to my sister. And I didn't graduate, number one, two, three. And yet God has chosen. God has chosen. You know, it's, it's interesting that the author leaves this little description here that he had, that he had beautiful eyes. I, I don't know if they would be the eyes that, what a model. I, I think the idea is very true that eyes are, what do we hear? Eyes are a description of a window to the soul. You can look at a person. You can, you, can, you can talk one minute to a person and find out whether or not they are in peace, at peace, or whether or not their lives are in turmoil. Why? Because eyes reveal that. I'm convinced of that. And he was handsome. There's something that, that David had as Samuel anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And I love this. And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David. From that day forward. There was something about this young boy that no one else had. The something wasn't necessarily visible. As the Holy Spirit rushed, looked at that. It has this idea that from that moment onward, David was acutely aware of the presence of God. He couldn't go left or right without being reminded of God's presence. David had that. I remember, I remember uh, years ago, just got out of college and I was teaching school. I was coaching baseball. Cool game. I remember a kid walked in and he was big and strong. And I'm like, I, 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 yeah, I want him. I don't know what he does. I want him on my team. And as tryouts started, that kid was a loser on the field in every way. He was a loser on the field. And I was totally wrong. And yet there was this other little boy. Remember, his name was Chris. And, and he was smaller than everyone else, but scrappy. Oh, my goodness. And I realized I can't measure. I can't measure that. And in my mind, I was like, okay, I can't, you can't measure on the outside because big guy, you thought, little guy, he's amazing. So it doesn't work. About 10 years later, I was pastoring a small church in New England. And I remember when a young couple was introduced to me. And I thought, oh, wow, a new young couple in our church. Great personalities, great communicators, good jobs, adorable little kids with the little hat thing going. Adorable kids. And I thought, oh, this is this, a couple like this. And yet they had, they had no hunger for the word of God. There was no depth. There was, there was no desire or view of eternity because they're too busy running their cute little kids to every single baseball tournament in the entire Western Hemisphere. That they were too busy for local church. I remember actually spending time with investing time into an, an older couple. It was his second marriage they had just retired, and, and I kind of figured that they'd be like settling and riding off into the sunset, whatever retired people do, and yet they just, they just dug in, and they worked, and they served. They, they were involved in kids' ministries, and the ministries grew. I would have never picked that old couple, and it's a great reminder that for the second time, I'm like, I am not, I am not. I'm not going to do this. I just don't know. 
I was visiting a church a number of years ago to speak, and I, I've told you this before. It's just one of those stories. And I, I remember that, that there was this old guy. He was huge. An old guy came up to me. He's like, Pastor, what do you think about drums in church today? Kids have drums in church today. What's that about? What do you think about that? And he's just a, just a crass kind of old grump. And I said, you know what? Drums, you know, it's, it's what drums are used for. Drums can be used for the glory of God or they can be used for the glory of man. If they're used for the glory of God, I don't care what instrument it is. As long as they're used for the glory of God, I'm fine with it. And he said, good, because I'm the drummer. <laughs> I just remember that. I'm like, I totally read this guy wrong. We do that. I do that by nature, in my flesh. We're reminded this morning, no, we have to stop. We have to examine the heart that God has called you, regardless of weaknesses, regardless of imperfections, regardless of your past. God has called you for his glory. 1 Peter, 1 Peter in chapter 2, it says this, you, you're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. It says once, at one time, you were not a people, but now... You are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. This is to you and I. We realize that God has called us, what? Out of darkness into his marvelous light. A couple takeaways very quickly with this is just know that there's a, a natural struggle within all of us. Know that there's a natural struggle to be more concerned about outward appearance rather than inward substance. That just exists in our flesh, in our brokenness. Know that. We like to look on the outside and we can't see the inside. But number two, what? Here's our challenge this morning. Stop measuring other people and yourself. Stop measuring yourself according to outward expectations and strive for what? Hunger for, thirst for righteousness, inward obedience. I know that the instruction is what? Stop doing that. Well, that sounds like, well, stop it. Stop it. When, when that's hard, in light of the fact that our, 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 our condition, we're conditioned in our sin-bent perspective to do that. So how do we stop doing that? Here's another one. Trust. Learn to trust God just as God chose David. God also has chosen you, broken and imperfect, to be part of fulfilling his plan. And be encouraged by that. And finally, what? We have the ultimate example before us. Never, ever, ever underestimate King Jesus, the ultimate king, who arrived, what, as a helpless babe, or he's just a, people would say he's just a, a wise teacher. Never underestimate Jesus, but see him as the true and ultimate solution to the world's greatest problem. He is our savior who rescued us, redeemed us from our sin. I know there's a lot there, but we have to know and stop and trust and never, ever underestimate the power of the Lord Jesus Christ at work in your life. I'll leave with this, 2 Chronicles chapter 16, for the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. David later writes in Psalm chapter 51 that the Lord desires what? A broken and a contrite heart. So let's start there. King David himself says this is what, don't, don't, don't continue to shovel all of your amazing gifts and talents. The Lord desires a broken, 
contrite, a humble heart. Start there this morning. Admitting that we're sinners. Admitting that we need God's help. Admitting that we fall short. And that in brokenness and contriteness, we recognize that God has chosen us for his purpose to move us from the struggles that we face to strength for his glory and for his glory alone. We're going to um, close in a word of prayer. And I just want to remind you that um, as we struggle in everyday life, if there's something that you are struggling with that you want someone to pray with you this morning uh, to come and we will pray with you, we'll meet with you, we'll talk with you. We touch on some areas that are really hard for us. But I would encourage you as Scott is leading us and the worship team to come and we'll pray that God will be with us in the midst of these struggles. Let's bow our heads. Father, we love you. We thank you for your word before us this morning. Um, just continue to guide us as we learn and grow to follow you faithfully. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.